Good morning, church. How are you doing this morning? I heard some people say they were good. That's good. (laughs) I hope the rest of you are okay with us. Good morning to those who are watching online. It is a good thing to be with you this morning. Would you stand as we read from the word of the Lord? This is from Psalm 18, starting verse 5. 5 through 9, it says, When hard pressed, I cried to the Lord. He brought me into a spacious place. The Lord is with me. I will not be afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? The Lord is with me. He is my helper. I look in triumph on my enemies. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in humans. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. This is the God that we serve, a God who hears our cry. And when we are hard-pressed, he takes us in and brings us to a spacious place with him. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's worship. Blessed be your name, the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name, and found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun's shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Sing every blessing. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your glorious name. Blessed 
like when we worship or when we pray that the Lord is somewhere else. As we've been learning about these spiritual disciplines of prayer and community and generosity and all these things, sometimes it feels like we're just kind of doing the thing. Like, oh, I'm going to do this thing to be close to the Lord, but he's somewhere else. He is not. He is not somewhere far out of your reach. He is with you right now, in this moment, with us. Isn't that what the Bible tells us, that he is Emmanuel? He is God with us? In the joy, in the offering, in the suffering, he is not far away. He is here right now. Right now. Our bodies were made to worship. We were created to worship something, right? Amen. And sometimes our spirits are downhearted and we have a hard time believing that God is with us. I just want to ask you right now, can you just close your eyes and can you open your hands to the Lord in offering and response? Allow your body to lead your spirit. When it's hard for our spirits to worship the Lord, we let our bodies take the way and and, and we have a physical response to say, Lord, you are with me in this moment. And so God, we acknowledge that we were made to worship you. God, we were meant to hear and obey your voice. And through that obedience, Lord God, there is deep joy and freedom. Hallelujah. Lord, would you be with us now as we respond? Would you be with our hearts and our spirits? As sometimes it is hard to see where you are in the daily struggle and the suffering of life. Would this posture be our hearts today? That we would say, yes, Lord, I will worship you. I know that you are with me. As we continue in our worship, would you just remain in this posture, whether it be a physical response with your hands open or a heart posture of just knowing that the Lord is with you. He is with you now. And let's sing. fail me now you won't fail me now 
continue to be open to you would we remain in this posture of hands open heart open wide to receive you and know that you are with us we love you and we thank you god we give you all of the praise it's in your name we pray amen hallelujah you can take a seat
God for these beautiful voices that are worshiping him this morning. So this morning, I want to invite Ashley to come forward, because guess what next weekend is? Does anyone know? It is the middle school retreat at Mission Springs next weekend. So do we have any middle schoolers that are going on this retreat? Come on forward. Come on Anybody else? Anyone in the balcony? Oh, we got one more. Come on. All right. And I'm also going to ask, we want to pray for these students. We want to pray for Ashley as she is going with these students. So I want to ask if there is anyone who has served at Mission Springs whether as a counselor or as staff, if they would come forward to help lay hands on these students and on Ashley. I would also like to invite rooted middle school volunteers to come forward as well to put hands on them. I know you're out there. <laughs> so come on, come on in the middle, you guys, so we can surround you. Ah, this is awesome. So will you pray with us, church, as we send these students and we send Ashley off next weekend. Uh, so Lord God, I just, I thank you for Ashley. I thank you for the call that you've placed on her life. I thank you for her heart for these middle school students. Thank you, God, that there are so many lives in this congregation that have been touched by their time at Mission Springs, that it is a time that takes us out of our daily schedule, and it places us in, a, in an opportunity to hear your voice strongly in our lives. And so we pray for each of these middle school students that are going to camp this next weekend. We ask that their minds and their hearts would be open to the words that you have for each one of them, that you would bring them into conversation with people who you will speak through and speak individually to each one of them. Father, we ask that this would be a time of fun and rejoicing, that this would be a time of bonding and friendship. Father, I just ask that they would be aware of your presence, but also to expect the unexpected, to expect you to show up in the least likely places. And so, Father, we put this weekend into your hands, and we ask that you would move and that you would be a part, you would be the one that transforms the lives of those that go. We ask this in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Wow, what a great time of worship and prayer this morning. If you don't know me, my name is Amy Gunlock. I am the Director of Worship and Communications here at Home Our Covenant, and it is wonderful to be with you this morning. If you have prayer requests or if you're new or praise requests, you can fill those out on the welcome card. They are in the seat back in front of you. We as a staff pray over these every single week, and this is just one way that we um, can come alongside you in your journey of faith and pray for you and rejoice with you and mourn with you um, in the things that happen in your life. So feel free to fill that out. We would love to get to know you in that way. We have, you guys guessed it earlier when Pastor Catherine was, af was asking what happens next weekend, but it's not next weekend. It is still a few weekends away. Trunk or Tree is coming up very quickly, and um, this is an opportunity for us to reach out to the community. It provides them a safe and fun place for them to spend Halloween night to come um, collect candy with their kids, and um, this year we are providing food for them, with, so we're having some, uh, wow, vendor trucks come and and um, have food for them as well. And um, the main ask we have is not only prayer over this event, that it be a safe place for the community and that people have fun, um, but also for candy. Um, we 
last year we had over 100 pounds of candy and we blew through that. <laughs> um, so I know uh, candy is expensive, so please give as you can. Um, uh, and let friends and family know as well. I'm sure everyone comes to this event. And so it's a great place, great way um, for not only us to support the community and to show them we care for them and we love for them. Um, but yeah, so thank you to those who have, who have already donated. We appreciate you. Yeah, I mean, what a better way to love our community than through food and candy, am I right? <laughs> That's tempting for me. I'm like, I'll be there. I'm so excited. Um, we also have coming up the Meet the Staff Lunch. We will be doing this on October 27th, right after church. This is for those who are new with us or haven't gotten the chance to maybe even meet me because I'm still the new guy, right? I would love to meet some of you that I haven't met yet. So if you are new here and you want to come get to know us, staff will be there. I think some of council will be there. Um, and you can just ask us questions, get to know us. Um, we would love to meet you and learn more about you as well. I know I was introduced a little earlier, but I realized I didn't introduce myself. Not only do I work <laughs> with middle schoolers, I work with kindergarten through 12th graders, and my name is Ashley, and it is a pleasure to serve with you, church. We have something super exciting. We have a blanket drive happening. Last year, we partnered with Clothes for Kids to, pro to provide blankets for kids of the community. Um, Clothes for Kids is a nonprofit, community-sponsored organization that serves local community school children that are in need of clothing. And as being a part of the family of God, we want to not only love him, but love him by loving others. And this is a great way, specifically by partnering with a local organization, um, we can go forward as Christ taught us and love those in need. So um, please help us collect and donate new blankets, um, bring them to the church office start uh not starting starting now but bring them to the church office by november 17th please and thank you yeah and they're asking for new blankets so if you have um the means to purchase and donate new blankets um that would be really helpful so as jesus taught us to go out um, this means locally and globally, right? So we have our Operation Christmas Child shoebox packing party. That is a mouthful. November 3rd, right after church. We are packing 100 boxes for these kids. And so not only do we want your help, but we need your help. Their slogan is, spread the good news of Jesus Christ by packing a shoebox for children around the world. So these shoeboxes that we have lovingly been um, purchasing items for, they are going to go to a child so that they have Christmas gifts. And this is also a way for them to learn about Jesus and his love for them. So we would love to have you come to this packing party um, so that we can pray over these boxes and pack them together as a church family. In Rooted High School, I have a surprise for you guys. We get to build the boxes. So Ooh. we'll be helping Norma out in that way. Um, with that being said, kids, are you guys ready to go to Kids Space? If so, come on up and have a seat on the stairs. And um, while they get ready and come up on stage, uh, church, we are learning about self-control up in Kids Space. And um, it has been a fun time. Last week, we learned about Jesus having self-control as he was tempted in the wilderness. And so uh, today's a fun story, so I'm not going to spoil it for them, but I'll tell you guys about it next week. Um, <laughs> I see some s slow walkers. I'll wait for everyone to come up. Some shy kids. Um, are you guys ready to go to Kids Face? Yeah. <laughs> On the count of three, let's very quietly, I suppose, tell the church, may the Lord be with you. Ready? One, two, three. At this time, I would love to invite the ushers forward. If you wrote down a prayer request or a praise request, you can put those requests in the plates that are passed. There's also a black box right in front of me at that entrance right there if you miss it that you can put those into. So I'm going to pray for us um, as the ushers come forward. Lord God, as we hear about these opportunities to love and serve our community, we are reminded that we are partnering with you. 
Um, and by our giving, Lord, this is just another way that we can partner with you and give back to um, your mission of loving others. And so we pray over this time, Lord God, um, as we are about to sit and reflect on all that you are doing in our lives and the community's lives, Lord, um, let this time be uh, a time for us to consider how you are moving us to give and participate in what you are doing. Lord, we know that um, that you are with us and, and that you are spurring us on to be part of what you are doing. And so, um, Lord God, would we just hear your voice in this moment? Would our, our hearts and our eyes and our ears, our minds, all of us, would we, would all of our senses be awakened to where you are moving us and calling us to participate with you? Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So as the bells play for us, um, let us sit and reflect on the ways that the Lord is calling us to be on mission with him.
to get up out of their seats, find someone that they haven't said hi to this morning, and give them a warm greeting. All right, as you find your seats, if I haven't gotten a chance to introduce myself, I am Pastor Catherine Shane. I have the privilege of serving this congregation, and it has been an amazing year and a half. Can you believe it's already been a year and a half? I know, that's how I feel. I hope more people feel that way. <laughs> So as many of you know, um, my family and I, we recently bought a home. It was a fixer-upper. Our work began the moment we received our keys. We tore out carpet. We washed walls. We primered and painted all the walls. We tore out the floor in the kitchen including four layers of that laminate sticky tile that was used. <laughs> we installed the new floors in the, uh, the kitchen and the bonus room. We also had the original hardwood floors refinished. It was an amazing amount of work to help us get moved in. We also found, left in our garage, the Holy Grail. You guys did not know that we've been missing that. <laughs> it's been in the garage this whole time. <laughs> Just the other day, I was walking down the hallway and I smelt a reminder of what the house was like when we moved in. This uh, smell, this subtle smell of old pet urine assaulted my nose. And, and I sat and I thought, after all the work we've done, really, it's still here? <laughs> and then this quick prayer passed over my lips. I said, Lord, what have we done? <laughs> but then, to my surprise, as I sat there, the word redemption came to mind. 
And I, I just got this sense that we are redeeming this house. And so when we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we ask him to be Lord of our lives, there is this surge of joy, and there are patterns in our lives that change. We begin reading the Bible, attending church, being in community. We are learning how to be apprentices to God. We learn how to pray. We just know that our life will never be the same. But then a past emotional pain will surface or an unhealthy relational pattern will reemerge or destructive behavior shows back up in our lives. And we think, well, I thought I was cleansed of all this. I thought that when I came to faith, I am a new creation. What is wrong with me? But the beautiful thing about redemption, it's a journey. It's not something that happens. Something does happen overnight when we, become, when we come to faith. But then we are on this journey of redemption. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit starts bringing cleansing into every single corner of our whole person. God wants us to be completely whole, completely healed. Catholic priest Thomas Keaton writes, when we commit ourselves to the spiritual journey, the first thing the Spirit does is start removing the emotional junk of a lifetime inside of us. Just like physical pain, emotional pain is some parts of our person that needs attention, healing, and love. When we slow down and come before God, all this undigestive emotional pain that we have pushed down or learned to cope with, it comes up because true redemption seeks to heal the whole person. It is learning to meet God in our pain and suffering. We are in a sermon series called Practicing the Way, and we are exploring what it means to be a disciple or apprentice of Jesus. An apprentice has three goals. It is to be with Jesus, to be like Jesus, to do as Jesus did. We will be reading from Romans 8. So if you have your Bibles with you, you can turn there now. If not, it will be up on the screen. But Paul's writing to the Christians in Rome. And the Christians in Rome are experiencing severe suffering. The emperor has done his best to expel all the Christians out of the city forcing them to leave their homes, their livelihoods, their friends. And in the midst of this turmoil, the church is fraught with tension. You can only imagine that disruption in their lives would cause tension among them. And so Paul is writing to the Roman church. And he begins in verse 18 I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subject to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage up to decay and brought into freedom and glory of the children of God. So what does that mean? Well, first, Paul is taking us back to the first three chapters of Genesis. In those first three chapters, God created a world that was good. In fact, good is used seven times in the creation context, in the creation narrative. And seven is this complete number. So it meant that creation was completely good. 
But humanity gives into the temptation of evil, which ushered our world into a time of suffering. All of creation with humanity was ushered into this time of suffering. This frustration and brokenness is evident in the way that we relate to one another, in the way our culture relates to one another, and in the way that we care for our world. In our modern day, when we experience suffering and pain, we tend to respond in three different ways. I don't know if these resonate with you. They do with me. One is deny. We can call, it's called spiritual bypassing, and it's using spiritual truths to bypass or skip over unresolved emotional issues, psychological wounds, or unfinished developmental tasks. It means that we deny what's going on in our lives, what the Holy Spirit might be bringing up. It's short-term and destructive. We tend to think or we say, it's all right, God has a plan rather than really acknowledging the pain in which we are in. Some of us might detach. We compartmentalize that, those feelings and we put them aside. We create emotional separation from our emotional pain. But one of the things that I learned from a therapist friend is that when we avoid that pain, when we detach from those emotions, we also detach from happiness and joy. We detach from the love, the fullness of life that God has for us. It's not that we can separate those emotions. It's either all or nothing. And we resign ourselves to, it is what it is. Or some of us, we use drug. Whether it is a literal drug or it's behavior, we use things in our lives to numb our pain. We use it as a distraction from God and from our pain, not allowing the Holy Spirit to bring wholeness and health. Paul is teaching in Romans 8 that there is another way for us as apprentices of Jesus. Suffering is real, and it should not be ignored, but needs to be put in perspective in the story of Jesus. It's important when we, to, for us to acknowledge what's going on inside of us. And so Paul He's saying that humanity, in that, in that passage of Romans, he's saying that humanity was, just as humanity was, creation was sub subjected to corruption, sin, and brokenness. He's saying that it was, didn't, it didn't just affect our lives, but it affects our whole world. But then in verse 21, Paul speaks of a future liberation to freedom and glory, which will happen when the children of God steps into the fullness of who they were created to be. So I just want to take a moment and, and present where Paul is coming from. In Jewish thought, there was the present age, and the present age was a post-Garden of Eden. It was marked by sin and brokenness and evil. But there was an age to come, and that was marked by peace and prosperity, wholeness, where there's no disease, no illness, no sorrow, no broken relationships. It is where the reign of God stands throughout all creation. It was marked by judgment day when all will stand before God. But for Paul, something amazing happened. In the life, death, but especially in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, sin and death were broken in that very act. And what happened for Paul was that the present age and the age to come overlapped. 
And so it was kind of, we live in this time of now, but not quite yet. We still experience the brokenness that comes with sin. But we also experience the reign of God in our lives as well. We experience the victory that Christ won on the cross and the healing and the redemption in which we can experience through the whole power of the Holy Spirit. We live with one foot in a world of suffering and one foot in the kingdom of God. Paul goes on. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have had the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly wait for our adoption to sonship as redemption, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope, for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. So one of the metaphor Paul uses is a woman in labor. It's one of the most painful experience, experiences, but also one of the most joyous experiences. There is something extraordinary happens when in the birth of a child. There is pain that gives birth to something beautiful. When we process our pain and suffering with God, when we go through that process, we give birth to something beautiful. The Holy Spirit heals and restores, pulling, in, pulling us into transformation and new life. How could we see this in the life of Jesus? Because really, when we get down to it, we're disciples of Jesus. So how did Jesus deal with suffering in his own life? We often go back to this particular night, but in Matthew 26, verse 36, Jesus, it was the night of his arrest, and he went with his disciples to the garden and he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And then he took his closest friends. He took Peter and his two sons of Zebedee along with him. And he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Scripture tells us that Jesus has experienced everything we experience on earth. And then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And then going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. There's a prayer of lament there. And yet, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus found a quiet place with his closest friends to pour out his heart to God. He prayed this prayer of lament. When we look at the example that Jesus laid before us, it's this invitation that we too can meet God in our pain. We too can pour out our heart to God, naming our pain, sharing our pain. We too can ask others to walk alongside us, to share our pain so that they can pray for us, that they can support us, that we can get help on our journey. But Paul does not end with the pain and growing, but rather he points to the hope we have in Jesus. He says, for in this hope we are saved. 
But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. The very pain and suffering that can sabotage our spiritual formation can be a portal to our spirit-empowered transformation. That's a beautiful picture, a challenging picture, because there's not one of us sitting in this room who has not faced suffering or pain. This next slide shows a painting made by the famous Dutch painter Vincent van Gogh in 1890. I thought of Ari when I saw, not this particular picture, but Dutch, right? <laughs> so what do you see in that painting? What feelings exude out of that painting? Despair. Sadness. I, I didn't hear that last one. Sorrow. Sorrow. So Van Gogh was the son of a minister. In his early 20s, he was a devout Christian who suffered with, uh, from mental illness and for a short time was a missionary. He struggled as he bounced from job to job, and he led a life of loneliness and suffering. This particular painting is titled, At Eternity's Gate. Just look at that picture for just a moment and think about that title, At Eternity's Gate. It is an experience of anguished prayer, of lament. It is when we meet God in our pain and suffering. When we sit in the place of this man, it is then that we have a pr profound experience of God's presence. Paul ends this passage with a promise. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We don't know what we ought to pray, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. What Paul is saying there is God is right in the heart of our suffering. God is not distant. God is not looking from afar, but is right next to us when we are in anguish, when we are suffering, when we feel as if things are going horribly wrong, as we experience the agony Sometimes we feel the absence of God. These, these are the moments that God is closest to us. Think about this. The Holy Spirit takes our groans, takes our agony, and intercedes. He prays for us. He translates what we cannot put into words. And prays to the Father. He intercedes for us. What a beautiful image of a loving God. The Spirit pulls up a chair right alongside of us, searches our hearts, and intercedes. We may have pain over our marriage, over a child over a career, a career, or maybe it's a death to a dream. We may suffer from physical pain or illness. It may be pain from the past, or it may be current pain. 
But God does not distance himself from us. But God sits with us. That is the good news. That is the promise. That is what Paul wants every believer to realize. That you are not alone. But God is with you. So I was recently diagnosed with Hashimoto thyroiditis, and it is an autoimmune disease. And for the past three years, I have experienced symptoms and suffered pain. It has been frustrating. It has been discouraging. I have prayed. I have had others pray for me. I have seen doctors, and I have grown, and I have prayed to God. And there are times when I'm going, God, I know you heal. Why aren't you taking these symptoms away? And in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of seeking God in this time, I have experienced the presence of God in my life. I believe that Jesus heals us miraculously today just as much as he did when he walked on the earth. I believe that God heals through the wisdom of doctors and medicine. I believe that sometimes our suffering produces spiritual growth that would not be possible otherwise. And so when Jesus prayed, if there's any other way to accomplish your will, let's do it. But not my will, but your will be done. It's being willing to sit with God in your suffering. And I have to say, in the last three years, I have learned a lot. I have learned to trust in the love of my Heavenly Father, casting fear and anxieties when different symptoms have come up and go, oh my goodness, what is going on with me? (laughs) Uh, And being able to say, I will trust you regardless. I will trust you with my life because I know that you know the days of my life in your book. And I will trust you with what you are doing. I have learned to recognize my limits and be dependent on God. A lot of times with my personality, I just want to take it into my own hands and make it happen. (laughs) It doesn't always work out the best. (laughs) And I've learned to recognize my limits. I have become more compassionate for those who suffer long-term illnesses and diseases. And I have learned to ask for help and allow others to care for me and to love me. When we moved our house, when we did all that work on the house, I would get to a point where I was so exhausted that I could not continue, which is not like me. I'm very much, let's push through, put your shoulder into it, right? Good Scandinavian motto, I hear. (laughs) But my body simply would not allow me to do that, and I had to ask others to come alongside me and help. And you know what? People showed up. (laughs) People helped. (laughs) As apprentices of Jesus, instead of creating distance between us and God when we experience pain and suffering, we can accept the invitation of God's presence in our midst. Paul invites us to see that our pain can draw us closer to God and towards prayer. Every single one of us in this room, every single person online, we are in the process of redemption. 
as the Holy Spirit continues to clean out the wounds of the past and the present. The question is, is will we accept the Holy Spirit's invitation of interceding and healing? Our future hope, the age to come, is grounded in our resurrected Lord, Jesus Christ. And our vision for what the age to come, the one in which we straddle both here and now and what is God's reign, our vision is found in Revelations 21. Just listen. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning, no more crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated, seated at the throne said, I am making everything new. And then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. That is the hope we live for. That is the future vision. But the reality is, is that we still live in the present age. We still suffer. We still have pain. And so during this next song, I'm going to invite the worship team forward and invite Art and Carolyn forward. During this next song, I'm going to invite you to just be open to the Holy Spirit's leading. And you may, it may be a time where you just sit with your hands open, as we did earlier, and just receive from the Holy Spirit. It may be a time that you want to come forward and be anointed with oil, be blessed uh, Carolyn and Art will be here. Gwen is in the back. I will be upstairs in the balcony. But it may be that you have a prayer request, something that's laying uh, just heavy on your heart. You can ask any one of us to pray for you. But this is a time for you to be honest to be honest with God and allow the healing of the Holy Spirit to come and fill your life. And I would be remiss to not invite anyone who has never committed their life to Jesus Christ To invite Jesus into their life today. To say, I don't want to do life by myself anymore. I don't want to face the pain and the sorrow by myself. I need you, God. And so there's a prayer on the screen. And I want to invite you to pray that. But I also want to encourage you that if it's the first time you've ever prayed that prayer, that you tell somebody, because it is cause for celebration. So take this time to be in the presence of God.
for the perfect Son of God and all His innocence, walking in the dirt with you and me. He knows what living is. He's acquainted with our grief. Man of sorrow, son of suffering, blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for distant and removed but you chase us down in merciful pursuit to the sinner you were grace and the broken you embraced and in the end the proof is in your words yes in the end the proof is in your There's a God who weeps, there's a God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah to the Son of suffering, oh blood and tears, how can it be that there's a God who God who bleeds, oh praise the one who would reach for me, hallelujah, to the son of suffering. You know, I heard this saying once that says, if you could hear Jesus praying for you, in the next room, you would not be afraid. If you could hear him praying for you, because he does, he prays for you. And so just as Pastor Catherine said, if you have a need, a praise, something to rejoice in, there are people who love you that want to pray for you, that hear the Lord's voice, and they want to pray for you. So I'd invite you, if you're not able to get up for prayer, if you even just want to raise your hand to receive prayer, there are people that will pray for you. Let's continue to sing. Your cross, my freedom, your stripes, my healing, all praise, King Jesus. To God in heaven, your blood is still speaking, your love is still reaching. All praise, King Jesus, glory to God forever. Your cross is my freedom, your stripes are my healing. All praise, King Jesus, glory to God.
Will you stand for the benediction? And we realize that sometimes it's a little t- intimidating coming forward, and we just want, if there are things that are on your hearts that you need prayer for, we have a prayer team in back who would love to pray for you. So as you go out, may you go out in the love and compassion of God. May the work that Jesus Christ has begun in you continue to completion so that you may be all that God has created you to be. Go out in God's peace. Amen.